Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackN, and this is the DevOps Lunch and Learn for March 16th. The topic of the day is edge computing, and we talk all around edge and its use cases and uh, how it would work. Uh, if you're interested in edge and you've been talking about it for a while, uh, you'll find a lot of themes that we've covered in the past here um, and maybe some new insights. I mean, for the most part with CDNs, the challenge is getting into S3 bucket. Like Limelight has, I forget, 400 gigs of direct peering with Amazon just to get things out of S3 buckets. Hmm. Makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. The interesting thing to me is there was, um, we're, we're giving me flashbacks to some of my OpenStack days. Um, specifically around the AWS compatibility arguments for it. And there was a ton of time that Randy Bias spent pounding the table talking about compatibility with the AWS APIs. And the thing that was interesting is I never found that to be the problem. The thing that always burned us was the operational patterns in AWS where those were different. It was much harder to work around than when the APIs were different. So something like needing a directory um, for the bucket name, you know, that ended up hard coded and stuff and you could change the, you know, the API, but the something, you know, deep, deep assumptions about a path or an operational practice or a, you know, how something's, you know, um, whether or not you can, you know, set, set the SSH parameter was, yeah. was much more damaging from a compatibility perspective. Yeah, uh, and then the shift from ECLs to IAM. Yeah. Yeah. It was, that was interesting. So I, I had a thing that I was thinking to talk through and, you know, once, once I started thinking about it, it, it realized this might, might grow into something bigger. Um, but I was wondering if, if we wanted to talk about edge operations, like walk through the idea of what it would take to run real infrastructures in, um, and I'm not too worried about defining edge, but a lights out small footprint, non, you know, a non -data, non typical data center and go mm -hmm. through what that, what the operational constraints of that would be and what it would look like to do a good job of it. Um, and when I started thinking about, that's what I was thinking about talking about, you know, today and having the group uh, sort of riff on that. It's an it's a, obviously an interesting topic for for me, but um, it strikes me that it could actually be a multi-day topic, and we could pull in people more broadly because some of the communities that are talking about this stuff are doing a really um, weird job. <laughs> it's I it's sadly it's like I've been watching the OpenStack stuff go, the open infrastructure stuff, and they've had this edge edge thing where they're writing white papers and things like that. They they just always start with how do we make OpenStack work in this in this use case? And you I don't know. feel like they they start with how do I operate this data center or you know, they're not particularly I don't feel like they're doing, and I haven't been to a lot of meetings lately, so maybe they maybe they leveled out and they're flying right. Um, they've got a ton of smart people, but I don't feel like they're having the conversations um, in actionable ways, more broadly actionable ways. I just wish they'd stop talking about latency. <laughs> why? Why do you wish they'd stop talking about latency? Because there's no use case for it. All right, unroll that. I'm super interested in hearing your the rant behind that, and then um, why why it's what what they should be talking about. So, th think about the the spectrum of latencies and applications that require. Right. So on the, the extreme edge of that, right, you have power grid management. Late, latency expectations, you know, that they would accept two milliseconds, they'd prefer some millisecond. There, there's not a network on the planet that can meet that requirement. Ah, okay. Or, or is there going to be? 
any time in the foreseeable future. And I'm not talking the next five years, I'm talking the next 50 years, right? So, so that's one step of things. Then start moving up that stack. Of what are the next things where we hit millisecond kind of things that drive applications? So in the 20 to 30 millisecond range, you have fast twitch gaming, right? And that's being generous, right? Because human perception is 80 milliseconds. Okay. So you're saying sure. my latency requirement needs to be faster than what I can actually perceive. Okay. So, you know, that's your next real kind of use case into these things. And, and you think about things like voice assistance where you don't like the delays and these other components too. Um, so what are the speeds of a wired network today? And what are the speeds of 5G? Right. We originally talked about building those things in like the sub five millisecond range. Then it started getting talked about the 10 millisecond range. Next time you watch one of those sprint commercials and they're doing the speed test download, watch the milliseconds. If they're 23 to 25, right? Because there was no business driver to build a lower latency network, even though we had the technology. Hmm. Okay. So ultra low latency is just a way of saying I'm clueless. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that's that's one aspect of it and if you think about the edge this gets to where i get at to um on edge when you think about envisioning what this edge infrastructure looks like if you look at the way microsoft built out their data centers right there have been two very different strategies the data center rollout if, if i look at amazon they're, they're big and tall they, they built vertical data centers if i look at azure they they built out, they built multiple data centers. So Azure in Germany has five data centers, right? Those are all certainly near access networks. They're all certainly gonna be in the 10 to sub 20 millisecond range. So why do I need to go any deeper? Not my latency. It's a good, I, I've, I've often wondered about that um, in the metros, right? The metros are pretty well served by, by a by main, mainstream commercial cloud data centers. So what do you think? What's the... Oh, for Edge? Yeah. I, I, well, so first off, you think about Microsoft right now, you think about all the major metros and the, the, the dense po population density stuff. I don't need to go any deeper than Azure. Give me a so, use. I mean, I spent five years trying to find use cases for this shit <laughs> <laughs> sure. and, and could not find it. And, and this is part of the problem, but, but I can't talk about the data center stuff, but that was really the thing. So there's kind of four things that would drive things to edge computing. Everyone talks about latency and throughput and, and it's just not there. I mean, with things like VDR, we solve throughput problems in TCP stacks, um, you know, and, and so, yeah, the second driver towards edges of volume, right? The sheer amount of data that is being generated um, can't be carried over traditional backhaul, right? Right. And and you think about connected cars, just the use case everyone goes to on, on those. Um, but I go to, um, on those, I my, my question on that, and, and once again, I've not really found a use case that justifies it. Where's the compute processing power today? It's in the vehicle. Mm -hmm. Right, like Ford was backlog. I think it was Ford because they they had a shortage of chips. Right. Multiple so if we need to do yeah. data aggregation or data distillation, why wouldn't we use the compute capacity in the vehicle? Right. How much of that data? It's generating mass amounts of data. How much of that data has value outside of the vehicle itself? I I'm tempted to answer that question <laughs> but do you, if i if we jump down that rabbit hole do you can we be able to pull back up to your other two two items sure. or I'll, just, I'll, go to other, two I'll go to the other two and then i'll, I'll explain to it so the, the the third one we get to is locality right which is the data is only consumed locally right and um you know i tend to use zoom as an example of something is a good locality to it right is the odds are if you're doing your zoom video you're consuming it, you know, near where the video was actually generated. There's no reason to backhaul to a central server and then access it from there. Or, or the other one you get into that one is data solvency, where you're simply not allowed to move it from a location. 
Sure. Right. It's restricted to an enterprise. It's restricted to a country like Sweden. Right. And that's kind of pieces to it. And then the fourth factor, which is the only one that I think has merit in it, is scale. It's the sheer volume of transactions means you can't do it out of a centralized data center to it. So, um, you know, there's companies in Cupertino that are having problems with handsets and the number of connections they need to maintain. But we're talking about a few billion handsets into it, right? What happens in 10 years when those devices are in the trillions? Right, so all the things that I think are leaning towards edge compute frameworks, I, I think it's the explosion of not edge devices. I don't know there's a lot of edge devices. There's gonna be an explosion of consumer devices and of enterprise devices that results in a scaling problem that we probably can't solve with our traditional footprint, but more importantly, probably we can't solve in our traditional software methodologies. I agree with that. Uh, more at the data level than at the infrastructure level. Um, I, 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 when, when you, when you scale up, uh, again, like, like you, what you saying, like trillions or more, or more, it becomes very hard to, to, to put that data in, in, in an asset compliant data store. You, you will have to go to, uh, like eventual consistency, whether it's sharding or, or, or some other approach. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, you can be more specific, right? It's impossible. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> at least with the current technology, yes. I, I think it's impossible, it, it, unless that is happening in a, a, a geographically tightly bounded area, it's just flat out impossible. Yeah, yeah and, and... And I, I still don't see us being uh, ready uh, from like I, it's it's not society perspective, but like from from a community perspective, um, to take that as a given. There, there's still too many cases where the assumption is that the data is always correct. Uh, I, I mean, and you end up with situations like, like, like Amazon's outage from, from, from last year, like where they just couldn't handle that much information anymore. And, and that's because they put it all in, in, in one central source of truth. truth. Mm -hmm. And you, like when, when you scale up, you, you cannot have one source of truth anymore. Uh, which means that you, you cannot have absolute truth. Well, even what they have today is not absolute truth. I mean, it's. I mean, I think Amazon offers a range of, of solutions around that, right? But um, you know, I Dino, like to use it internally. DynamoDB, I think, is is kind of like one of the better examples where they they've actually given you a tool that's pretty good, where it's it's. It's a read-based consistency, right? It, it surfaces the, the resolve problem up to the application developer. It's just like doing a git commit. There's a conflict. You have to resolve it at the application. Level. But so anyway, Ron, I mean, those are kind of the four ways I kind of break it down. And the more, the way I would draw this on a whiteboard is take those four quadrants. The more of the more impact those quadrants have, the more likely it is for that application to be pushed to the edge, right? So, yeah, that, that would would drive the economics of it. But, um, yeah, it's not latency. Sorry, that's my rant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're back. To, uh, I yeah, I, I don't I don't think it's the short the short latency that's the same. I I, I think that there is a latency component, um, but. It's interesting right. that the thing that I see is actually a combination of the pieces that you're talking about. Um, where to, you know, I see edge is more environmentally based computing. So you're reacting, you have local things reacting to local things and the current and the latency to me is not the, you know, a game server to the device. The latency is device one talking to device two 
and having to trombone through a remote cloud interface and you know not not having access but that that you know when i look at what i could see happening if we can fix fix scalability scalability and oper operation challenges is that you could have a much lower cost to add an uh, environmental device, whether it's a sensor or a camera or a motor or something that's reacting to your environment um, into the environment that it needs to operate and then have it get and share data locally to that, that system. The car example, and the reason why I was tempted to go down the rabbit, rabbit hole in the car is the idea that the car is doing all the processing, which is where it has to be right now, is very much like, oh, we're replacing drivers with, you know, computers. Um, but that's the, that's not the better design. Ultimately, I would expect us to have intersections that manage traffic through the intersection, and so they're going to, you know, the intersection would do, you know, track all the pedestrian traffic, track the Traffic, the car, the flow of cars through it, communicate to all those cars in the system, talk to other intersections to see what's what's coming to them. It shouldn't, you know, the car, that we're not going to share all that information into the car. Uh, the car should be, you know, controlling its local function, receiving the information it needs from the tra local traffic controls, and then you know, limiting it because we this, the pro the idea of putting more and more compute into a car uh, has a one has a finite bound and two it's we it it needs to level and, and decrease because it's going to be super expensive and power hungry to make car you know cars into data centers. Um, um, go ahead. Well, we've had that conversation on two different planes, right? Um, you know, one is, you know, a 5G network where you have smart streets, whatever you want to call them, mm -hmm. that are interconnected in. And, you know, there was at one point in life, a uh, company we worked with that uh, was building intelligent um, light posts, light poles. Mm -hmm. Right. They actually could hold data centers inside of them. They actually had cell on top for power interconnected with fiber. Um, and actually, they looked at providing like a drone landing pad where you could actually land drones, yeah. control them, provide drone um, drone coordination, a, a, a air traffic controller for drones, if you would, um, into it. And we actually talked about running, you know, um, you know, Kubernetes asked as a distributed control plane on top of those at a city level to coordinate some of that kind of stuff. Interesting. Um, communications piece of that though is is either you know one of two things or a combination of them. So there's a number of stuff being worked on at a vehicle to vehicle, right? So it's it's yeah. short range. Think of Bluetooth to Bluetooth interconnected with vehicles for the vehicle three, um, a vehicle three cars in front of you behind a truck and you can't see and yet it could still alert you, right? So that's that's one set of possibilities. The, the other possibility is obviously you know small cells on five G. Or more importantly, is, is, you know, the, the stuff we talked about, I talked to Boris, I forgot that I should see if I get Boris. So, you know, the stuff they're doing with the private, um, the private 5G, and he's doing it almost all this world under, under privileged communities. Um, you know, they do terminate IP at the, the cell tower, um, which is not the case with the others. Um, so if you needed to be lowered and say 20 milliseconds, you know, private 5G could potentially do that or some combination mm -hmm. of those things. Um, so we have talked about those different types of use cases. Um, I, I know of no deployments where anyone's really trying to do that. So the closest thing that came to that was looking at um, the drone example for doing um, field maintenance, fly around the wind, wind mills and see if they need repairs, right? Um, yeah, do, do high definition video components to it, um, go to a damaged site and do those pieces to it. So there's quite a bit happening in the drone side. Yeah. Um, and then I haven't checked that in a year or so. The problem they had is that the, the chips in the majority of those drones were coming out of China. And then basically the U.S. government said no. And then like a whole new series of drone companies had to be started. Um, so there's that right. piece of thing. But even did like, you, go did, ahead. Did you ever, you ever, I don't know if any of you guys thought it's, it's been a while since he's working on this. 
So Van Jacobson, um, you know, the guy who did like the TCP congestion control and whatnot and a bunch of other things. Um, so Van had a, a thing where he basically declared, we got the internet wrong. We're, we did a bad job. Okay. <laughs> and started advocating. And really the premise for it was, is that the rate at which um, storage is the cost of storage, the rate at which cost of storage is decreasing, and the rate at which compute is decreasing, um, exponentially faster than the rate at which bandwidth is going. Ah, John, we're losing your audio right. again. And so um, they started basically saying we need better modeling, and they started basically what they call it is content-centric networking, where what you wanted to find was a piece of content, how you found it, you didn't care about it, but it was heavily reliant upon. Um, device to device communication, which may be a little bit closer to where you're thinking, right? The, the challenge we always had with that piece of things is are you willing to give up storage in your cell phone for better access or storage on whatever device you have in your home? So the trade off, you trade off storage on the device for access? Yeah, so let's imagine. Um, let, let's imagine that you're on the example you would use. Let's imagine you're on an airplane that's got no Wi-Fi and you want a copy of the New York Times. Someone else on the airplane happens to have a copy of the New York Times, right? So I could obviously access from that device and download it onto my device, right? Um, yes, yeah, so that's what I mean when I want device to device access. So think about the original uh, master type of thing, right? Or file sharing services, right? But the average consumer for, for both, you know, want of it's their device and they want to store their data on it, right? And privacy concerns generally doesn't engage that kind of behavior. Interesting. The, 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 the reason why I'm thinking about that, that type of stuff, it's convenient I, I'm not sure that any amount of storage distributed through a group is going to solve your can I find the thing I'm looking for problem, especially because you have to also index and track it, which then requires some external, some mass, some uh, distributed index that people participate in. That's an amazing. Okay. So you mean like IPFS or uh, now, it torrent really much, tracking? It, it, it was very much like a route to that, right? If you're building a BGP network, I don't need to know the entire BGP network. That's a fun route to play, where I just need to know what my next hops are, and I need to know what I'm going to find. <laughs> we keep losing John's audio. You get quiet, John, and it's hard yeah. to hear you. Uh, sorry. <laughs> it could be either. So I'm just saying you treat it like a router. And so there's a policy okay. information that forwarding based, you know, PIP that he would actually forward the request to, which would forward it up the routing chain. Um, it was actually very effective. But I think that part was kind of solved. It was just too radical for people who adopt. I, yeah, I mean, that's part of what we turned up with the 2030 when we, when well, we talked to the 10 year, the 10 year future for it. Go ahead, Greg. I was say, Sony did a research project on it where they used the cars as basically HTTP caches, because one of the biggest problems in like downtown Tokyo is that they overload the cell phone towers. And so they were setting up, um, quote, smart um, traffic intersections, and were basically using the cars as HTTP caches, CDNs. And it basically cut the outbound traffic to certain sets of the websites and stuff. Well, overall, it cut down the traffic like by 50% out of that cell region just by basically temporarily caching web pages onto cars and other things. And so when somebody was walking around on the street asking for the latest times or whatever, the cars didn't know and you weren't actually asking for the data, you were just passing it around. It was an interesting use of that kind of technology, and it seriously offloaded the upstream cell towers. But you still got to have, you know, a bunch of infrastructure in place to create localized um, 
elements. And to me, that's the part of the edge that we don't necessarily talk about is that kind of set of things where you're like, well, that's actually a win. It's not amazing and it's not really awesome, but the carrier cares a lot. So that may be a reason to do it. Yeah, you know, I think the one that most people get on that is, you know, we did a similar, we basically added caching inside the cell towers. And, you know, if you're inside of an airport, you, you know how good the quality is there. <laughs> The, I mean, to me, I think we're, I'm, I'm in strong agreement. The idea of having it, local infrastructure that you can use in, in fungible ways seems like a really valuable uh, component for this, right? That, that to me is where we, we get a lot of things we're building for edge right now feel very much like IT silos or rebuilding Amazon on, you know, in, in, my, in my neighborhood. And I, it doesn't feel like either of it is quite right. Yeah. So um, I closed my window, so this is better. But um, I think the way people think about Edge today, where I was kind of getting to, um, was that the traditional, I'm going to extend my Amazon Edge out, right? And it's going to be driven by an IoT application. It's going to be driven by, you know, it's other kind of just an extension of my centralized compute down. Not a strong believer. Right. I, I think possibly in 10 years, the use cases may come around for that. But what I really, I think, did start to understand is uh, metropolitan based applications, not edge, but regional applications. Like I said this before, I, I could start to see a number of regional applications evolve that weren't necessarily, per se, edge. Mm. Right. But they certainly weren't a centralized cloud. Um, concept of how we're going to expand these things out and so when you talk about the connected cars you, you talk about a lot of these other things you think about it at a regional not kind of a, a cloud century view to it i think you can find things that start to make sense so let me go down that path if i have regional if i have a, a regional uh connected car application I might be able to maintain all the traffic control, all the components within a appropriate milliseconds latency, including camera feeds from the intersections into a regional data center with, with, with cost-effective networking. It's sort of where, where we're going with that, right? Sure, I think, you know, if, if you think about it, you move in and out of basically different zones that are, are monitored by different air traffic controllers. Right. And, and if you think about infrastructure in that same light, right, you, you would think about I'm moving into the San Francisco zone. My vehicle is now connected into that network. Right. So I think there's some parallels between the way you know, aircrafts have built these out with you know, autonomous but coordinated uh, control zones that actually kind of make sense. Mm. So I'm, I'm thinking about the swim, swim AI cases where they're building. AI and digital twinning into the inter into the sensor networks, and maybe this is where there's a, a, a mismatch, right? Because they're doing a fair bit of AI and sensor processing and event event processing on devices within the the local zone, and then you're subscribing to updates from that that digital twin. Very different than what we're talking about from a centralized data center. Maybe I'll just cross the streams and that's not helpful, but. Right, because I, I mean, I'm, I'm, go ahead. No, I think, I think it, it's a class of application inside of this spectrum, right? If they're doing data distillation, right? And or data aggregation, where I've got the volumetric sides of things, some of these to basically take it down to the part, you know, eliminate the noise. Right, or aggregate the data into things that people are actually interested in and then provide a mechanism with them to access them. But I look at that as just a class of application and, and I wouldn't limit them at maybe where they're doing those things, but those things can occur at multiple points inside of the network. So if you have your, your bank transactions and every night you backhaul them into a central location, 
you know, their technology still provides value, right? It doesn't require being placed at the X to drive value. Right. I guess, uh, maybe we're, maybe we're looking at the telescope from the wrong end. Um, why centralize? What, what value is the cloud providing in that, in this transaction that would lead us to not distribute it? Because centralized is cheaper and simpler. It's simpler. Yeah. It, it, I mean, when you, when you're scaling up, you, you start with centralized, like even if you, if you say you start in the, in the edge, like single location, you're centralized at location. <laughs> then, then you grow and you, and you say, okay, I'm, I'm going to lift and shift this to the cloud so, so it can be bigger. It's still the same design, the same architecture, which is centralized. And only after you start growing the, the like, centralized in the cloud is, it, is when you start considering, okay, let's distribute it. Mm -hmm. uh, so so it, it's a matter of, of inertia. Okay. The inertia part's part of it, right? Um, but the way, I don't know if you, 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 you mean it, right? So the inertia part, for example, when Microsoft is building out data centers, they have a 30% year over year growth rate for just generic compute, right? So they have an inertia that allows them to build out and do things that enable edge applications that if you're just trying to make a complete edge play, you, you don't have. Right, so in our case, if we're trying to do, for example, SD-WAN um, and distribute it down in the Intel, right? How many nodes do I need to deploy for an SD-WAN node? Two, right? What, what's my command and control stack? If I was gonna put OpenStack out there, how many nodes do I need? A lot. Right. Yeah, that's right. So, you know, when you get into these things, we talk about the, the metaphorical, you know, street lights and cars and vehicles and that stuff, the, the, the command and control to work in those environments needs to be fundamentally re-architected. Which, which brings up uh, a good opportunity for, for me to, to, to open uh, another line of thinking. So, so, so Rob, you, like, you, you mentioned, yeah, like why, why centralized, why, why, why the benefit? Another way to look at it, I think is, Let's look at examples of, of edge computing that that have worked. Uh, and, the, and the thing that comes to my, my mind uh, related to uh, command and control is botnets. Botnets are inherent, mm. inherently edge computing. And you have the, the command and control there. Uh, and, and you have a mobile command and control in many cases as well. So. So in terms of oh, that's an interesting way yeah. to think about it. Yeah. In, in in terms of edge computing design, they're doing pretty well. I mean, it's it's also a, a very domain specific implementation, but I, I think from an architect architectural perspective, you may have some lessons to learn from from that. You know, I, I almost turn back back to reverse way. One of the things I wanted to do when we were working with the various service providers was to get ac access to their NetFlow feeds, right? That the, the power that the, the botnet operators have is that, that they're, they're coming in in channels that are hard to trace because we don't have access to the data. It was like, you give me NetFlow, I, I'll, I'll find the botters. Right, I can track down where those tra traffics are coming through. I can track down which nodes they went to, and I can figure out the source of who launched that particular, whatever it was, you know, using the bot network into it. But that's actually, you know, that the stopping botnets, right, requires access to data, but it actually is a good edge compute use case, right? Because I can do security and aggregate data at the operator level. I can do a bunch of really interesting things. Mm -hmm. I guess the, and the botnets are a good, interesting example to me because edge is more in, if we're building a whole bunch of thin devices, edge is not going to happen for building. If we keep putting processing capability 
if it keeps getting cheaper and more ubiquitous, right? That's where I guess the bot, to me, the botnets are along those lines of thinking. Then there's a lot of compute infrastructure available environmentally, right? At the edge. It's not, it's not a question of, you know, building something new. It's just a question of leveraging capabilities that are there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And spare cycles. Our, our, our centralized architecture on, on or more to the point, our very siloed uh, design uh, leads to, inherently to the waste of resources. And, and, and in many cases, it's warranted because you, you might need it or, or, or you need to guarantee it. Right. But, but again, in, in other cases, uh, like you, you, you really, you, you, you need it for burst and, and then it's, it's idle. You, you see that a lot in, in, in CICD, um, that there is a, a, a very clear rift between two approaches. One is you, you have your dedicated inst work instances for, right. for CI. Um, and, and the other one is you, you have like on, on demand billing, like you, you you, you bring it up, you, you're consuming the, the resources and, and, and then they go back to a pool. Um, I mean, the, the latter is, is more cost-effective when, when you have short workloads. The, the former is more cost-effective when, when you have longer workloads. Like for example, if, right. if your compile time takes, uh, um, takes an hour, even on a thread ripper, you're gonna need uh, those dedicated instances, particularly if you, if you need to cache the, the, the intermediate results to, to cut down on lead time. Yeah. Um, that there, there is, I mean, if you look at Circle CI, like sure, they, they do dynamic caching be, between between builds uh, on informal workers, uh, but they have a limit. Like if you go above a, a, a certain, I think which was 500 megs in, in, in cache size, it gets invalidated. But would that mean that we could, in that analogy, move that into more and more environmental compute? Like what keeps somebody from having, servers are, are relatively cheap, right? What ha, what's, maybe this is the right question for ask for edge, right? As somebody who has, you know, at least five computers running around my house, usually idle. Um, what, what's, is it reasonable that all that compute power could be used somehow? And then would that be edge computing? I mean, would that, I mean, I've, I've, we've talked, I mean, this is like the SETI stuff and things like that, but that's not particularly useful to me, at least. It's just distributed algorithm. It's just reusing compute cycles. It, it is a good question. Uh, I mean, it it poses it poses a, a fundamental problem. Is that I mean, it's it's not just the free compute cycles that 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 you have to consider. It's, it's also the cost of, of running those cycles. And we we've, we've kind of gotten used to having our devices on twenty four seven. Mm -hmm. That did that didn't used to be the case. Um, and, and part of it is that by having them on 24 seven, like we have them available 24 seven. Right. Um, but there is the, the, the cost, the, the power cost, <laughs> the, the, I mean, well, please, please don't run steady on my phone. I'd like to have a battery life of more than five minutes. Exactly. <laughs> Well, this is this is where I, where I went was your Tesla could be a Bitcoin miner when it's parked and fully and plugged in, right? There's more. There's there's plenty of GPU for you to be doing um, compute compute. You know, GPU. You could be using those GPUs at yeah. night when the car's not in operation. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there, there, there's also the, the question of ownership. Uh, there's clearly some people who are going to uh, do not be happy. Uh, with, with allowing other people to use their, their devices, like the, their, the, the it's mine and, and I do with it as I want to camp. Or, sure. or, or 
I mean, did, e even for the people who who are willing to to either donate it or 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 make it available at at, at a price, there's the possibility of of just abuse of it as well. Um, well, but to me, just to me, you've just backed into why a what is it the telcos would potentially want to do that right because you're basically saying i have the potential of compute resources and i don't know who's going to run it but they are going to have a set of applications so they're going to want to run something out of a choice because in some regards everything you've talked about has some policy implication of it right i really don't like cancer research so don't ever run a protein folding program on my program right you have all sorts of that kind of thing and part of my question then becomes okay is that really a telco's place to put that at the edge for people to choose arbitrarily and i think we're all struggling to say what's the app for that right That's well, the and the only one that really the only one that functionally really comes to my mind right if we do the flipping the why not centralized is the 5g streaming wave that I envision happening. I, I mean, where, where data locality matters and yeah. being able to stash data at regional or potentially even at a cell level becomes hugely important because I can't backhaul that back to even a regional and still have my intra cell networks survive. Yeah. Yeah, so so I mean, you, you kind of get to the point, right? Of, of what I was, I was trying to say, like uh, to put it in a different way, is I, I started out with with, with 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 arguing yes that we have to all of this, all this all this uh, waste of com computing power. Um, I also argued why we have to this waste because again, uh, conflict of interest. Uh, let's put it that way. <laughs> Um, and, and I mean, that, that, that's kind of my point is that the, the way our computing architecture, uh, the way our compute, computing power distribution is currently designed, it, it's, it's inherently centralized. Uh, and right. and, and it, it, it's going to require a, a, a very radical redesign in order to to make it possible to decentralize it, going back to, to your argument, Greg, about the telco thing, um, would we consider Comcast's like Xfinity thing to be edge computing, where where, where they use people's uh, home internet for uh, for wireless uh, offloading? Yeah, I don't know why not. I mean, I think it, it is effectively an edge computing system, right? Mm -hmm. Now, it's very proprietary, it's very localized, it's very focused, but sure. Yeah. Why, why, why restrict what somebody could run there if they came up with something to meaningfully provide, right? You could see, for example, Ring wanting to offload right camera analysis to that, that thing mm -hmm. instead of pushing it back through. It doesn't have the capacity to do that. I, I, know them, I know the comp, we've had these conversations. There's no compute capacity to handle that type of problem. Uh, what well, I was trying to get to, to get with, uh, to with, with, with bringing that up, uh, Greg, is that we're effectively, like Comcast in, in their case, is effectively putting users in, in the same conundrum uh, that, that that, that you brought up in, in, in that the user has no control over what the third party is using that bandwidth for. They could be, they could be looking at other at at kids' pictures. They could be looking at other people's kids' pictures. Uh, and uh, I mean, who, whose responsibility is it if, if, uh, if that network is used for illegal content. That's going to be yeah, I would say not just is, compared to internet, DOCSIS is probably more secure, actually quite a bit more secure. 
than the than general internet traffic is. You know, that, that's been built in from day one because they didn't want to get their content back. Right, the days of, hey, I found a cable and plugged in. Right, um, so yeah, those that content flowing over that is strongly key. The key changes every 10 seconds. Um, so we, we don't have anything like that on the general internet that even comes close to what you see in the docs is real on or you know, their predecessors into it. But I can tell you all Comcast cares about is how do I tack another five bucks a month onto your bill? What, what service can I add in there, whether it was game acceleration or it was extended you know, parental um, uh, security into it? They're, they're trying to think about how to monetize that, that footprint that they have. Right, and, and knowing that the value they've had today is effectively the access to the cable on the ground, and that you know five years from now as we get more into five G, it, it's no longer about um, physical connectivity. Right, as we become more of a, a wire wireless driven society, that that value of real estate diminishes. So it's all about how do I generate additional billing? If they thought they had an application that involved edge compute. And they do a rev share, they, they might do it, but think about the pragmatics of that. The pra the, all these use cases are fine if you take them out of the real world. Right? Right. But let's imagine you had to switch out 800,000 set cost plots up for them. What do you mean? Hey, That's sorry. a huge revenue. Sorry, Rocky, I didn't see you. Uh, That's okay. But yeah, I'm an Xfinity user and I'm really pissed off that they're using uh, the fact that I need to have their box. I can't use a plain old modem in my house. And since their box is in my house, they're using it to sell phone to other people and sucking down my bandwidth and not providing me the bandwidth they claim they're providing. So mm. yeah, they're, they're, they want to get those boxes in your house and charge you for them. And the only reason they have those boxes in your house so that they can tack on other people's uh, uses. No, I'm one of those people. I don't know. I talked them into letting me use my own modem. I refuse to use their hardware for that I, reason. I have to actually wire the house before I can do that. So I have to and mm. uh, get under the house and, and put in two cable connections. Once those are in, then I can go on on uh, the modem I actually purchased and get off of theirs. But yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting issue because I have unstable uh, bandwidth through them, even without other uses. <laughs> but they're the only game in how... town in San Jose. They're the only people who can provide better than like about ten megabits a second right now. Oh. Yeah. Same for me. It, my only other choice is 4G. Yep. Hmm. <coughs> uh, these edge conversations always leave me more confused than I started with. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's it's good because what I uh, what I ultimately think is that what we we have a lot of different things that we're all calling edge, um, and that the uh, real use cases aren't well, aren't, aren't that well understood. Um, yeah. I think there's a lot of people talking about theoretical use cases, but you know, the, the challenge is when you start running them down, right? Because when you ask them up one where the cost of deploying the infrastructure um, generates a return that makes it worthwhile. Or the, the physical limitations, like Bitcoin mining, you don't want to use probably any of the PCs you have in your house to do Bitcoin mining. Right? <laughs> mm -hmm. That's right. Well, um, well, it's yeah, and the the Bitcoin. There's a uh, I want to I want to be respectful of the time, so um, we can we'll, we'll pick this up. I I, th I want to think about how to narrow it down because I I would actually like there's there's operational questions that. I think are, get really interesting to ask if we if we can narrow narrow a set of use cases and then start thinking through how do we manage infrastructure like that. Um, and it's hard because right first we have to talk about what's the use case and how do we use infrastructure 
Um, so I have to think through how to bracket a conversation so that we can talk about actually managing, re, you know, an infrastructure, a distributed infrastructure. So way back when in, um, at the dev conference uh, that uh, open, then OpenStack ran, mm -hmm. we came out with four different uh, cases in that edge uh, communicate. Yeah, the edge, open dev stuff. Yeah. The, the open dev stuff. So it might be worth revisiting what uh, they've done since then uh, or just revisiting the original white paper. But uh, we, we got the uh, telecom perspective very well from Beth Cohen. And then there were a couple mm -hmm. of other, and they had four, I believe, four generic areas of uses, of use cases. Yeah. But I don't think they had botnets on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was actually a very, I've never thought of that before. Botnets is. Yeah. You know, let me, uh, let me um, reach out to Jason Hoffman. Um, Oh, I love Jason. Yeah, was, please. Yeah, I mean, I'd be curious to see where they got with Mobile EdgeX and the use cases they came up with, and they were pretty actively. And, and he was thinking. What I liked about Jason is he was the average telco. No, no offense. Was um, their use cases were not real world. Um, I think Jason was trying to do a lot more usable things. Let me paint him. Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd be fun to bring him in. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thank you for entertaining my <laughs> conversation on Edge. So appreciates everybody's time. Thank you for joining us for a DevOps Lunch and Learn. Uh, great conversation about Edge. I, I keep leaving these Edge conversations feeling like I know less than when we started, and so um, that shows that there's a lot to be lot to be thought about, and um, that we really need to figure out how to narrow the topic. And I'm going to be doing just that. Uh, and trying to come back for edge operations tech, uh, conver you know, uh, technologies and approaches um, on maybe some smaller footprint use cases in the future. So please join us for those things at the 2030.cloud is where you go to RSVP and come into the sessions. Thanks.